Welcome to another episode on the Curve Glory. This week we look back at the really, really poor performance against Fulham, but don't talk about it too much. And we also welcome back John McKenzie, who tells us that it's all going to be okay under Ange. Oh, and it's also Gary's birthday. Welcome to another episode of Echo of Glory. Joining me this week, Gary Diamond. Good afternoon. And Jake Robson. Good afternoon. Hello, Good green team. Wow, you said that's rude on the others. <laughs> oh, geez. How about that? <laughs> oh, geez. Oh, Origi- goals. Original yeah. gangsters. <laughs> I've got my defensive centre halves back. I've got uh, Romero and BDV back. <laughs> I'll take that. I'll take that. You've been on holiday again? Yeah. When was the last time I was on holiday? You've been on a lot of holidays. <laughs> Don't miss this pod. 17 trips to Marbs. I booked them around the pod. <laughs> yeah, I was skiing last week. It was uh, it was lovely. You lost your phone. It was stolen. And it, yeah, where did it pop up five minutes after you lost it? Uh, yeah, next. By the, I lost it in the afternoon. Next morning, on, I'm tracking it. It's in Marseille already. <laughs> I was in France. Yeah, I was nowhere near Marseille. Wow, incredible. So yeah, make of that what you will. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, okay. We did forget something. Ah, <laughs> it's a bit of a visual aid. It's a birthday. It's an Echo of Glory birthday for Gary Diamond. Happy, Happy birthday, birthday to you. Just one rendition of that. It's Gary's birthday. <laughs> Happy Echo of Glory birthday, Gary. Thank you very much. Very <laughs> good. That wasn't a, uh, very good. That's funny. We know how much you enjoy birthdays. Thank you, indeed. We draw attention to it in front of the full audience. Really appreciate that. <laughs> Thank fullest. you. Do you remember when we forgot your birthday in Leeds? That was one of the best days, actually, one of my best birthdays, to be fair. <laughs> and we, me, me and our f- uh, friend, mutual friend Simon cobbled together to make Gary dinner. Um, yeah, what did you make all... him? Anyway, we don't have much time, so let's crack on. Let's go. Come on. How... He hates his birthday. How old are you? Well, my daughter thinks I'm 39. She insists that I'm 39, so I'm going to stick with that. But your, the, your birthday's relevant because what always happens when it's your birthday? Uh, so, I mean, this is true. This is uh, probably one of the reasons I hate my birthday is that Spurs always managed to lose in the most comical fashion of the season every season. A few years ago, it was my 40th, and we lost 3-0 to a team that uh, didn't have a manager. He was in prison. Uh, a couple yeah, of seasons Dino ago, Zagreb. this time last year, it was Southampton. Yeah, we, didn't, the, we drew. We drew, but it was the Antonio Conte meltdown and, uh, you know, tearing the house down with him. And, uh, and, and this year was see, Fulham. So, yeah, uh, you can have some cake. It's my fault. Are we going to make Gary eat it? I'm not having cake. Right <laughs> right. Thank you. James, so made, producer kind. James made that for you. We, well, honestly, we haven't got much time on this podcast right. chat about interesting things like that. Yeah. Okay, look. Well, maybe this is better than chatting about Fulham, to be fair. <laughs> exactly. Club news. We'll start as we always do. Um, the under 21s beat Middlesbrough 2 1 on Sunday. They're too clear with two games in hand. I've had a look at what happens. I don't. They don't just win the league, they go into some convoluted playoff, but it looks like they're going to be in those playoffs. So. Their season will continue beyond the normal league season. No game for the 18s. Chelsea and West Ham won. Titles all but gone. Um, but they've had a fairly good season. And the women's team won 1 0 at home to Leicester in a dress rehearsal for the FA Cup semi final. Scored an early goal. And I watched the highlights. I don't know if you saw them, but they just, yeah, yeah they're clinging on at times, but two fairly evenly matched teams. But a that's going to be a close semi final, you know. Yeah, Martha Thomas missed again. She's missed a few games this season. They missed her energy up front, but Jessica now has put in a nice ball for the guy. I know you like her. Yeah. Um, Beth England came on and steadied the ship. And the club have announced that the semi final on Sunday, the April the 14th, will take place uh, against Leicester at the Tottenham Hotspur Stadium. 12 o'clock kickoff. Uh, I'm going to get myself down to that one. I'd have loved to. I'd have loved to go on my daughter, but um, it's, I think I said last week, it's my mum's 70th and we've got a, a lunch for her. So I won't be able, and it's at 12 o'clock as well. So there's absolutely zero chance. Um, but I would I would recommend everybody who can get down there because uh, I think it's five pounds for kids and fifteen pounds for adults. I thought fifteen pounds for adult was a bit bit steep. Could have could have done with a tenner, but uh, all the same, get yourself down there because uh, they will need the support and it's an opportunity for a Spurs team to go to Wembley. Ticket prices, nice segue. You went on last week, Jake. Just quickly, your yeah, yeah. Did you not hear where I was, I was skiing? I lost my phone. <laughs> <laughs> your thoughts on end up in Marseille? Did, it? <laughs> did, where, did. Where, the, where phones normally end up? <laughs> well, yeah. Your thoughts on season ticket price rises and the, the slow eradication of the concessions? Careful now because. Because well, I'm, I'm staring at a couple, am I? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I? I'm interested to hear what you have to say. I, my first thought when the season, when the ticket price increase came, I'm reading that email myself, going, I don't want to pay any more money. Mm. 
than I'm already paying. I pay a lot of money. Uh, and But you do, I think you do have to put it into some context. And Gary, I think you did this very, very, very nicely and succinctly is that Thank you. it hasn't been, there hasn't been many rises since the, has there been one? There was one small one. one small the, new one. the new stadium. The new yeah. stadium. One. One. We've had a good run. They're going to have to, it's going to have to rise at some point. Everything gets more expensive. You yeah. can't go on forever. But I do also agree that it feels like the extra money they're going to make was well, not, it's not going to make the biggest, the hugest difference to the club in terms of a value, you know, a figure. So I don't know. I don't know what the, the there's no perfect answer, but you can't expect the tickets to stay the same forever. That's just, that's we all, just we're all agreed on that. Yeah. I, know, not just, I don't mean you guys, but I mean, there was a lot of complaints about it. Yeah. Yeah, I mean the concessions thing. I wasn't really aware that the that that I knew the concessions thing this time. I didn't realize what you said last week about yeah. uh, they'd already got rid of some already. Yeah, yeah. Whereas well, that you can't get you can't get concessions on OAPs or children. So it's all one level. Yeah, flat yeah. Season ticket price. I mean, yeah. I mean, I I'd like. To, I, hopefully, we'll get to hear at some point the thinking behind it. <laughs> because well, they, well then I mean. They're probably not going to come out and say, "Well, it's so we can make more money." There's obviously got to be some. They're going to try and come give it some kind of spin. Yeah, yeah they're, not, they're not going to. They're not going to address it. And it is about you know wanting to make more money. Ultimately, yeah, they're, yeah. they're not going to address it. They're not going to give a reason. It's I, just. Wrong. I know. I, I. I'm not. I'm not saying that I don't care about the senior end of it. But I, the one. The thing that really up, disappoints me about the juniors is that how on earth are you going to encourage? The next generation, you know, it's a cliche, isn't it? Yeah. But how on earth do you, how do you do that? Well, well, well this is the thing. I mean, you know, my, my, my brother and I and, and, and Johnny, you know, we, we've all got kids and, and, and going forwards, you know, I, I, I don't think my brother's kid and, and, and our kids are going to go to as many games as what they otherwise would because we're going to end up sharing a ticket for them mm. rather than getting their own tickets. Well, but you're not, I'm not even talking about season tickets. I'm talking about, uh, you know, got, uh, young kids or, you know, young, uh, older kids who can have, who have got, go, go have got their own money? Yeah, How can go, they afford to go and buy themselves just a you know a normal ticket for a game? I don't know. It's a great. It's a good question. You know, it's a good question. It's, it's so, a concern. Yeah, but it's not just us. That's for, it's not just Tottenham that has this problem. No, of course not. No. But unfortunately, there was an incident at the Fulham game <clears throat> on Saturday where I think the um, there's a, a movement started to, to stop this. Save our seniors. Is that what it was called? And they had a banner taken down. I I, I don't know why all Spurs fans are not behind this. It's one thing. You know, we can all argue about whether Werner's good enough or whether Andy's good enough or this, that and the other. We can all have our opinions on that. I don't get why everyone isn't behind this because it, it's got to be sorted. Whether the club will or not it remains to be seen. But let's talk about Saturday. We talked last week and we said that uh, Aston Villa was the best performance of the season, the most rounded performance of the season. And then we come to Saturday, which was probably the worst of the season. Arguably, Brighton was bad, but the last 15 minutes against Brighton was actually quite good. We couldn't maybe have snatched a draw out of that 4-0 for two defeat from 4-0 down. We lined up on Saturday with one enforced change. Vicario in goal, Porro, Romero, Dragusin in for the injured Van de Ven, Udogi, Basuma and Saar, Kulisewski, Madison, Johnson, Son. Okay, so there was one change. We knew what the change was going to be. It was just bad. I think the, the, the biggest disappointment for me was I was sat here last week saying that I thought the Villa performance was a, was a performance of a coming of age for a team. It was a really mature, professional performance um, and I, it was the type of performance from which you could springboard from and, and really finish the season very strongly. And the disappointment is that it is followed. And, and this, there's a couple of disappointments. Another one is that this is the first defeat of the season where I can say, number one, we were comprehensively outplayed. We deserve to lose and there's no mitigation because, you know, in every other defeat you can think of, there has been extenuating circumstances or whatever else it is. You could say Mickey van der Ven didn't play in this game, but it can't just be Mickey One van der player. Ven. It can't just be. Outside of Mickey van der Ven, you know, there, there were no mitigating circumstances. That were, there were no sort of extra things going on around it. It was just bad. Um, and it was a real shame it came right in the back of that Villa performance, which was really, really good. Um, it's one of those where it's just... <laughs> you almost want to say Spursy, where it's like, well, where does this leave us? Are we good or are we not so good? Or is it somewhere probably in between? We knew there'd be bumps in the road. Yeah. But this was a really poor performance. Yeah. It, it really was bad. Guess what? What? No, I do think it was. I'm not going to... I'm going to be optimistic. No, but I, when I when I watched the game uh, at first, I was thinking to myself, where, where on earth, what on earth is going on here? You know, when they scored the first and then the second. 
when I watched the game back, when I watched the highlights, I, br- I had to remind myself, we actually had a couple of really good chances yeah, in do. the first 20 Well, I know you minutes. like XG. Yeah, it was 2.76 against 2.41. I was going to come to at the end. Yeah, our XG, oh, was, well, no, at the, yeah, that was something that I also noticed. So we obviously, you know, there was a couple of chances. We didn't start as badly as the game now you would maybe think looking back on the score and the general feeling of it. So I'm not sure it was I'm, ugh, comprehensively yeah. outplayed. I think I think every so often, firstly, that the, their first goal. Can we talk about the first goal? Yeah. yeah. Can we? I mean, it's a good goal. That's a good goal to score for, from the attacking point. Of and view just as we got, standard. just as we started just to get in the game, Anthony Robinson has, has managed good to player. dig out across. Yeah. It's found uh, Munez, and he's taken a worldy of a touch and a pretty good finish. Now, maybe you're going to tell me that um, had Mickey van der Ven playing, he might have got there a bit quicker, but it was a fantastic touch and well, it was a good finish. As Gary's just said, we can't go, oh, if van der Ven had been there, we're yeah. going to have to move on. So uh, every so often, times. and Jamie Redknapp said this on the, the Sky coverage in England, you know, sometimes you do just have to hold your hands up and say, that's a good goal. And you're not necessarily going to be able to defend every single goal, you know, that, that you can see. It was a good goal. And I actually think that, uh, that, and again, that first, I don't remember what happened after that first 20 minutes because... Dragerson in the first 20 minutes looked like he'd been playing in that position for, you know, a good couple of years. I think later on in the game, but certainly at the beginning, I was thinking to myself, actually, this is this is looking all right. Yeah, it wasn't. Listen, it was one of those games where on another day, had we grabbed a goal and gone one up, everything could have been so very, yeah. very different. Mm. The disappointment was the brittleness of the performance. Once we went a goal down and we talk about us wanting to score goals and clusters, that's effectively what they did just before halftime, mm. just after halftime. Yeah. But we just needed to be stronger. I can tolerate us going a goal down. There, there were the warning signs throughout the first half that this could happen. At the same time, you're right. We could have grabbed a couple of goals ourselves. So it wasn't a disastrous all round, but it was just the brittleness and how we kind of collapsed um, when, when it did happen. But then, you know, you could even say it 3-0. Werner sticks in that chance at the far post right. three one, and suddenly we could have a late rally, and God knows what happens because we can score in clusters, and we could have dragged it back. That would have masked a poor performance otherwise. So it wasn't all doom and gloom. I agree with you, and I'm not going to sit here and say the world is falling apart. <laughs> it was just you know you've got this opportunity with a game in hand on Villa to go into the fourth yeah. spot, right? Um, Villa weren't playing uh, until the next day against West Ham, you know, and, and we've just thumped them four 0 and you go and eradicate okay it was an eight goal swing on that day this is a three goal swing so it's not quite but you're going to eradicate a lot of that that you know goal difference advantage you go and eradicate a lot of that good feeling that, that we took away from that performance and it just feels like you've taken one step forward and yeah. three steps back you, you mentioned know? Werner coming on I thought there was it felt like there was a lot more urgency when he came on now whether that's because of his the way he looks when he runs he feels he's sort of very energetic and all frenetic but he obviously does give you that energy doesn't he? And the pace. I, I've said this before. Kulisevsky moved to the middle. We had Johnson then on the right, which is his most natural position. You mentioned the starting lineup. I'm not sure anymore that that is our best, certainly front four. I think playing Johnson on the left now is gone. I think that should be gone. We've got we've got Son, we've got Werner. Why do we need to play Brennan Johnson on the left Agreed. when he's naturally right best side. in a right side? Yeah. We've also said before, maybe he is better as a super sub. Maybe he is able to impact the game a bit more. That that I will maybe is in question, but I, there's no question that he should be playing on the right. And I still now wonder whether Kulisevsky is a better option than him or not on the right. I think that's maybe open for question as well. I think Johnson has played really well. And, and I definitely don't think, and I think that Werner, I think Werner or Son should be playing on the left. Uh, that's do, do, it. Do, do you think that... that- Part of the problem that we've got at the minute is you can take a look at most of the other top teams around us and you could say, and most of the fans will be able to tell you what their first 11 is, no matter how deep their squad, they could tell you what their first 11 is and each player in their position. Right now, we don't know who our best well, six is. We don't I know agree. who our best right midfielder is. We don't know who our best left midfielder is. We don't know who our best striker is. Like, we don't know who our best midfield three is, what what make up a trio that no, I is. Don't, I'm, I, don't, I don't agree with the forward. Uh, the midfield bit, yes, I do. I think we've got to a point where now it's kind of, we're not really sure. I, I think there's no question that at Tottenham, our best striker right now, but the best option to play as the number nine is Richarlison. Do and, you? And I, 100% I keep changing do. my mind. And the I, best, I actually don't, actually. And the best uh, the best makeup for our team is to have Son on the left, Richarlison uh, through the middle, and then maybe um, when Johnson or possibly Kulisevsky on the right. 
I think that's just, I th we've said this before, the way that Ange wants us to play is to, you know, crosses in, you have the striker within the width of the, the goalpost and Richarlison is the best for that. Maybe when there's, we're playing against different opposition, you might want Son there. If you think he's going to come one-on-one -on -one chances, then he's the best man for that. The thing is about that though also, I think the flip side to that is look at, as a squad, we're now in, where we as fans aren't sure of our best 11. I mean, I know I'm trying to put a positive spin on everything, but we've now got two players, especially going forward, in every position. But, but, and but, but a few but, years ago, that is no, going I, forward. I, I going agree. forward, yeah. I, I agree with you. You know, suddenly, but, but, we're, we're, but, the game's not going so well. We bring on Werner, Richarlison, Benton, Kulisewski comes the, inside. The depth of the squad now versus what it was is, 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 is infinitely better. But the issue is none of the players are so far ahead of any of the others yeah. that it's like they're all of a standard. Yeah. And I wonder if to go forwards, in you know, we need that a, a, a player in every position that you can say, he that's, started. that's the one but and the that's is, his position. Yes, you know? but the problem with that and, and uh, you know, I don't even, yeah, maybe Liverpool, poss obviously City, City's a different kettle of fish. I wouldn't say that you would, uh, City's 11 is you could name City's eleven. There's question marks. So maybe who would play on the left? You know, they they do alter it depending on the opposition or how many games they've got. We had this for years. Who, we, who can we sign that's going to make our eleven any better? And that was the flip side to that. Do you remember when we had yeah, Ericsson, yeah. Ali, and we're thinking, well, no one's going to want to come to the club because they know they're going to want to sit on the that's bench. A great point. Yeah. So you're a little bit damned if you do and damned if you don't. And what you have is someone like it's up to the manager, therefore, to make the players that he has into some of those. Yeah, I, I completely agree with you. And we are in a far better position than we are. So, you know, I think I don't want to get too down about Fulham. It's very easy to get down when you've had a, a, a chastening defeat. But ultimately, as a whole, the squad is in a stronger position. The football is still good. There were positives to be taken out of that game. On another yeah. day, it could have been a lot better. We are still, I think, in the driving seat for top four. And I think, you know, in every defeat, you have to learn your lessons. And sometimes you, uh, you, you learn a lot more in defeat than you do Absolutely, in victory. Absolutely, but so. am I allowed to have a few concerns? Because I'm a, bit, I'm a bit like this Aussie idea is we'll score more, one more goal than you. I'm not sure it's working. It works. And I was really angry after Fulham. And if you follow me on social media, you'll see how angry I am. And I've got a bit sort of, I don't, this project of Ange, the way we play, mate, I think it's great for, it's fun. We will play attacking football. I love the way we're playing. I love being able to go to a game, sitting down, bar Fulham going, we're going to play attacking football today. But I don't know if that lends itself for what we all want, which is trophies, but sust uh, sustained title chases or top three, top four finishes. I don't know if the way we're playing at the moment uh, works. I think he needs to adapt. Let's find <laughs> out. Do you want to talk to a man who might be able to tell us if it's going to work? 100%. Is he going to give us the definitive answer? He's going to give us a really good answer. He's been on the show before and he said a lot of really good stuff. He does, he does. Let's talk to that man right now. <laughs> Delighted to welcome back to an echo of glory, writer and presenter for The Athletic, John McKenzie. Hello, John. Hello, guys. It's great to be back. Thanks for joining us again. Uh, so we had you on in the summer, uh, just after Ange had taken charge. We hadn't seen a ball kicked. We're now seven months into his tenure. How have you seen the start? Yeah, interesting stuff, I think, because I think the areas where I was maybe a little bit more concerned with what we would see from Ange Postacoglu was on the out-of-possession side of things. Um, and I actually think that out-of-possession Spurs have been relatively good. I think there are some weaknesses here and there. I think you can be sometimes a little bit susceptible to opposition throw-ins in their own half and <laughs> leaving yourselves open yep. you know, as we saw against Fulham yep. but um in in general yeah really impressed with with the out of possession stuff a lot, a lot of uh, um I think evolution there and I think a big part of that is to do with the fact that Postacoglu doesn't take his coaching staff with him wherever he goes so yeah. we've seen different people working um in in different areas for him um in terms of the in possession stuff again things that we um, expected to see. Um, uh, maybe the area where I was a little bit surprised has been for Spurs breaking down low blocks. We'll go on to talk about, um, I, I guess, wide forwards who can go both ways, who are very good 1v1, uh, because I, I think I identified that in the summer as an area where uh, if you're going to play this kind of style of football where teams are going to start sitting deep against you, you can get a huge amount of upside from those kind of players. And I think that that's where we'll start to see um, improvements from from Postacoglu, but I think it's very early days I, as a neutral fan. Mm. Um, maybe maybe I'm not so, so down as, uh, as, some as, as some of the Spurs fans. I think there's areas for improvements, and I think there are um, legitimate criticisms about the style of play that Postacoglu has if it doesn't evolve, and I, I guess that's what we'll get into today. Yeah, well, I think that's my my question, really. 
I have a few concerns. For me, it's a little bit the Aussie Ideal school of, well, we're going to score more than you. I don't think that works uh, in the Premier League. We had a great start to the season, unbeaten in our first nine or ten, and then obviously the Chelsea game happened. Look, if Son had been onside and we'd gone 2-0 up, who knows where we'd be now. But is it is it am I wrong to be a little bit concerned that the way I see us playing at the moment is if Van der Ven's not going to cover and clear the ball out, and if Vicario is not saving it, we're going to have to score two goals to, to win every game, and I just don't know how sustainable that is. Yeah, I think in the current guys, you're right to have those concerns. But I think what's interesting about managers who go on to be great managers in the Premier League is that they come into the league and they adapt to the to the style of play that they that, that I think can that that makes the Premier League the best league in the world. And that is we've seen it particularly from let's say Jurgen Klopp, who who came in wanted to play like a super aggressive transitional style of football, direct football, using counter pressing to generate chances. Uh, and realized very early on that he wasn't going to be able to challenge at the very top level without being able to implement um, ideas of control into into his system. And we saw him do that very, very well. And I think for me, that's the the big question with Postacoglu is, will he make that awareness? Is he too idealistic? Is he going to lean into, that's just the way we play, mate? Mm. Uh, or are we going to see um, him implementing those sorts of ideas of control which will allow them to not only go goals up and score a lot of goals but then sit on those leads and be able to uh, you know possess the ball in a way where you're not constantly threatening to lose the ball yourself uh, but also put the opposition under pressure keep the ball away from uh, away from your own goal uh, and close to the opponents without necessarily having to attack the whole time and that's what we've seen from I've, I've already mentioned Jurgen Klopp but Mikel Arteta in the last season I'm, I'm not sure what the rules are about me mentioning an, an Arsenal manager on <laughs> this podcast but yeah, only once. yeah okay I've I've used my, I've used my uh, free hit, but w- one of the things that he has been doing with Arsenal over the last few seasons is making them a, a team where, okay, maybe they're not the most attacking, uh, the most threatening, threatening team from an attacking point of view, but they now have uh, solutions in every phase of play to make it really hard for the opponent to score goals themselves. Mm. Uh, and that has made Arsenal title contenders. And that is what I think needs to be introduced into Postacoglu's system in some form. I'm not saying he has to go completely into that style of play himself, but he needs to have ways of developing the the system so that there can be more elements of control. John, let's talk about the wide forwards because there's been a a fair amount of change and so on throughout the season. This was an area that you, as you mentioned, you picked up on in the summer. Um, And we've seen Kulisevsky out wide on the right. We've seen Brennan Johnson. We have seen uh, Richardson start the season wide left, followed by Son and Richardson going into the middle, and now Timo Werner. The odd cameo from Brian Hill, which I don't think we'll be seeing too much of again. Um, where are you at with, with this? Because this was one of your concerns, and, and what does Spurs need to do in that area, do you think? Yeah, I think this is a really interesting topic. Um, I've just had uh, actually recorded a podcast for TIFO this week uh, on on Spurs with Nathan Clark, and we talked a lot about what needs to come in, in that area. And on the one hand, from a tactical point of view, um, Spurs have developed a system where it's a, it's about repetition in, in, in terms of the chances that are created. So you have these wide triangles made up of the, uh, the fullback. Obviously, the fullback likes to get super high up the field. Um, you have the wide forward and then you have the eight on 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 the on the ball side. And these triangles are developed to be able to possess the ball around opponents, move it often to the byline uh, and and play cutbacks, uh, generating essentially like repetitious chances in and around the 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 six yard box. And we've seen um Richarlison have just his best goal scoring season ever because of the way that the system suits what what he's doing and we can we could we could discuss whether or not Richarlison is the best option uh, that Spurs could have in that situation but the whole idea then is being able to constantly and efficiently repeat those kind of chances um and that relies obviously on 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 a number of different things you can you can do that through the interplay between those three players in those wide triangles one of the best ways that you can also generate that those kind of chances is by having what I call a two-way winger. So a winger who can go either way around a player makes it much harder to defend. Um, players who are, are very good at, at receiving the ball and, and then from a standing start um, go around a player, which I think is maybe an area where Kulisevsky is a little bit lacking. I think he's a, a brilliant ball carrier when he receives the ball at pace uh, and can, you know, he can has has performed a function for Spurs in certain games. But I think if they got a really, really elite two-way winger who could Standing start, go around fullback either way, hit those, um, hit, either cut inside or hit the 
hit the cutbacks, that's going to make Spurs a really, really dangerous proposition. Uh, ironically, John, is our best... I don't think he's good enough, but actually the one player in our squad that would do that would actually be Man or Solomon, who I've seen can go both ways. I don't feel any of our wingers actually do that. Yeah, and I think that this is the difficult thing, right, is that if you're talking about a player who can consistently go around Premier League fullbacks, you're talking a, a player who's going to be upwards of 70, 80 million pounds. Yeah, yeah. And I think this is the part of the conversation I was having with Nathan Clark was... Can you even bring those kind of players in at the beginning of a project? Could, for example, Nico Williams as an mm. athletic club mm. is a player that everyone is talking about right now because he is, you know, the gold standard of a player, two-way winger, go either way. Will, will they be able to take on any fullback? But that player is going to cost you 80, 90 million. And when you're competing for the signature of that player, you're going to be competing against clubs who are consistently challenging for yeah. titles in whatever league they're in. So a, a, a big thing for me is whether or not um, Postacoglu can build that base with Spurs, whereby you can then start attracting these super elite players who can just raise the profile of the club simply by uh, fitting into that system and being the best option in the world in in those areas as well. So, yeah, with Kulisevsky, to, to bring it back to the original question, um, I think, yeah, he's he's been completely functional. He's a, he's a great player. Um, you, can, you can play him as an eight as well at times. Um, but for me, in some of those games where he's up against a really good fullback, where he's receiving from a standing start and, and having to go around them, uh, maybe not producing as much upside as, as maybe Spurs would want him to. John? I, I, more than even the wide areas, my concern about the team at the minute, and you spoke at the beginning about the control that we have in a game, and this player is the player that should have been in there to give us that control. But I actually think this is becoming the biggest problem in the Spurs team, and that is the six. And Benton Core hasn't quite fit the mold there I thought he could have the man that's meant to be as Basuma and I love Basuma but it feels like it's not quite working there what are your thoughts in that area because I think that's where a lot of the problems are coming from yeah absolutely and I, I think look, if you could marry together a player with with Eve Basuma's ability to resist presses and and to evade pressure with Benton Kerr's energy off the ball and ability to make um you, you know, uh, short passes under pressure with consistency, then that would be, you know, that would be the sort of six that you want. Again, it comes back to what we were talking about before, which is when you start talking in, in the terms of those kind of sixes, you're talking £100 million mm. players. Like Declan Rice cost £105 million for Arsenal in the summer. And again, he's not a completely well-rounded six. The the the, the completely well-rounded six profile Rodri. is, is Rodri, exactly. And again, if you want to get a player like Rodri, you're talking upwards of you know even approaching 150 million pounds right that's that's the issue and again w when it comes to Basuma versus Benton Coor, the 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 argument then has to be well should we be pl be playing with a single pivot mm. if our single pivot isn't able to be that well-rounded profile at the elite level yeah. mm. um Postacoglu could do that in in the, the Scottish Premiership because he had Callum McGregor and Callum McGregor for the level is Rodri but when you get to the Premier League, you then exactly. the, the question is: Can you can you field a, a, a player who's only half of one of those sixes? Um, and if you can't do that, do you need to change the structure up? Do you need to have a double pivot where you've got a player? And we've seen this happen. Uh, to be fair, at Spurs, we've seen Hoiberg being brought in late on in games and 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 then playing alongside Basuma. Again, this is just the reality of really elite football. If you want to have a player who can do everything, it's going to cost you a ton of money. Um, and and yeah, you're going to be comp when, when you're Spurs, you're going to be competing with a lot of other clubs who probably would um, find it easier to tempt those players away. So again, questions raised about how the system responds to that. Um, and again, the way that Postacoglu answers that will tell us everything we need to know about how good he is going to be a manager at the very elite level. Mm -hmm. But then, John, what what do you think has happened then? Do you think we've maybe been found out a bit? Because I've, after the first 10 or 12 games, everyone was saying, goodness me, Bissouma, where's he been? Conte didn't even want him. He look, looks like this fantastic player, great on the ball, you know, positioning fantastic, pressing amazing. Is the system maybe, as the season gone on, maybe been a bit found out or he been found out in that position? Again, this is, this is the Premier League. I think this is what happens is that if you have weaknesses and every team has weaknesses, there's no team that's tactically perfect. Um, the, 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 the coaching staff, the uh, analysis, the performance analysis staff are good enough to start identifying what those issues are. It may be the case that they, they, I mean, it, it is the case that they are, you know, doubling up on Basuma to make it impact Spurs build up. 
And obviously that's going to leave them light somewhere else. And this is the, you know, this is tactics. It's, it's, it's a game of trade-offs. It's yeah. the poor man's blanket where, you know, you pull the blanket up to keep your head warm, then you're making your feet cold. And again, the best managers are the managers who are able to identify where those weaknesses are, how those weaknesses open up and how they're going to respond when opponents find those, those weaknesses. Um, and the Premier League at the highest level now is just a constant battle between, you know, when when Manchester City are playing Liverpool, it's Pep and Jurgen Klopp recognizing where those weak areas are, finding solutions to that, and then finding the next next weakness. And it, you know, it's a it's just a constant you know, people will say chess game. Um, and and there's an element to which that's what modern football has become. So again, all comes back to with Postacoglu, is he going to be that idealistic manager who's going to say, we don't need to worry about other people's systems because our system is good enough to be able to compete at the top level. I just don't think there's any system like that at the highest level of the game. The best managers are always the ones who evolve. The best managers are always the ones who can read the game tactically and work out where weaknesses are in their game, where weaknesses are in the opposition's game and find ways of really exploiting them. It's interesting you say that because we've <clears throat> spoken to uh, a gen uh, James Holland who played for Ange uh, in Australia, went to the World Cup with Ange, didn't actually get on the pitch, but he was trained by him in the squad. And we've I've spoken to other players away from the pod who've played under him. We've got another guy, Thomas Broich, who played for him in Australia, coming on next week. They all say the same word every single time, principles. The, the number of times James Holland said, these are Ange's principles, uh, it must have been five or ten in that podcast. For me, this whole Angeball thing has worked, obviously, in, in Scotland. This isn't the SPL. This isn't the J-League. This is the Premier League. He's obviously a better manager than just, this is the way we play, mate. Would you see him being good enough to adapt to the rigours of the Premier League? We've seen mid-block teams like Wolves and Fulham just school Tottenham in the last uh, four or five weeks. It's I think it's going to happen consistently if he doesn't adapt. Do you believe he will be able to do it, even if he can't bring in that? hundred million pound midfielder and he has to keep playing with Basuma or, or someone who might not quite be good enough. Yeah, look, the, the story of Ange Postacoglu's career is that he has excelled at every level um, and he's made his way to the top absolutely deservedly so. Yeah. Um, I think that, you know, the, the, the thing to say about him is that there are positives there that you simply wouldn't have got from any other manager that you'd have brought in almost unless you're going for like a truly elite coach and that is your build-up play is elite and teams struggle with it teams adapt that the way they're playing when they play against spurs which is the highest compliment i think that a, a build-up game can be played so that you know it's not just the case that we're just saying well you know we've got a guy here who isn't really able to cop it right at the top level immediately as we've already said jürgen klopp took two three seasons to to learn how to do that but uh, what we saw with jürgen klopp was something that was worth persevering with yeah and giving him the space to be and the players to be able to um, to be able to develop, make those evolutions. It's way too early in the cycle to to write Postacoglu off at the highest level. Oh, absolutely, yeah. But I do think that you know from what we know of him, he's a smart guy. Um, he understands the need to to evolve and has done at a number of points in his yeah. career. And I have I have every faith that he will evolve um, at, at this level. And it's worth as, as well noting that, as we've already said, you know, the teams who the, the teams who really make it at the highest level have to spend money. Right? We can talk all we want about Arteta's tactical acumen, and it's he has tactical acumen. He's a great manager. They spent two hundred million in the market last mm -hmm. year to get to a level where they're challenging um, with um, with Arsenal. Um, and that model is just, as things stand, is not the way that Spurs can do it. So, that, that again, it comes down to trade-offs. And you have to say, OK, well, we're not going to just be able to plug in a hole and say, yeah, we've got Rodri now. So suddenly that tactical problem goes away. Yeah. What, what has to happen is you have to think of ways around it. You have to think of either tactical solutions. You have to develop youth players to, to come through and fill those, those gaps. Um, and all of this, you know, it, it, it takes time and it takes patience. And I think um, that's the that that's the the message that I would want to to leave this podcast with. Lots of questions about Postacoglu, but also Rome wasn't built in a day. And Correct. and yeah, I think I, I think of all of the coaches that you could have got. I think that the positives that come with Postacoglu, both on and off the field, are, are well worth you know a season where you you see very clearly some of the issues that, that are lying in front of you again we've we not talked about fullbacks for example but i said in the summer yeah. this is a back three squad this is a squad that's been built for a, a back three system that means you have wing backs rather than fullbacks this is going to be a really big problem you've yeah. sailed through that almost yeah unnoticed until 
Horro and Udogi aren't available. And then it's, yeah. you know, it's, it's um, Emerson Royale and it's Ben Davis. And then suddenly you're like, well, does this system not work? Well, it's clear that, again, that's an area where with a few more windows under your belt, you'll have better backups. You'll be much more consistent. Um, and I think that's that's sort of where we're at with Spurs. It's just a, a case of seeing that slow improvement and not having to worry about the fact that, you know, there are three very good teams in the Premier League right now. I mean, the very fact that Spurs are, are looking likely to finish in the Champions League spots with a new manager, I think is is testament enough to the, the job that Postacoglu is doing. I completely agree with everything that you've said there. And um, I think Ange will evolve. And, and everything that we've seen this season, you know, anybody that's built a business or anything, will never tell you it was a linear straight line from A to B that, you know, it's up, down, sideways and, 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 and the route is always going to take much longer and, and, and we've got to be patient, but it is about, as you rightly said, well, are we, are we seeing enough to persevere? And for me, sure as hell I am. Yeah. I'm very positive about it overall, but that doesn't mean to say that we can't pick up on areas that can be improved. So. Yeah. A lot of people have said similar to what John said, nowhere near as eloquently. And I've sort of been, eh. but now John said it, I'm, 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 all, I'm all for it. <laughs> Yeah. I think as well, that John, that, you know, Johnny's mentioned that people talk about and stick into his principles and this is the way we play, mate. I, I, I don't think that the principles and this is the way we play, mate, translates to I'm not going to evolve. The principles yeah. remain the principles. We want to be a front foot possession team. We want to be aggressive. We're going to press. Mm -hmm. But you can evolve within that as well, whilst retaining your principles and playing the way that he yeah. and, he's going and, to and I think he will. Yeah, look, Manchester City are the most principled team and they tweak the way that they're playing against certain teams. I mean, we saw it in the Champions League last season. Sometimes they press with their front two. Sometimes they press with their wingers. These are very different ways of, of, of structuring your pressing approach, but um, they still have the same principles underlying them. Um, and I think this is going to be the interesting thing, right? It's going to be what are those sub principles tweaks that we see from Postacoglu where we still watch that team and say, oh, this is an Ange Postacoglu team, but oh, there, there was a weakness that we've identified in previous games and that's gone now. I mean, the, the great example is that I think it's the second game against goal against Fulham, which is where you get hit just with a couple of passes through the midfield area from the opposition throw-in because the way that you're structuring your defensive system um, in that moment is leaving Destiny Odoggi completely exposed. Now, you can still play the same way and in those areas, make sure that you're not leaving that kind of uh, weakness there without suddenly just, you know, tearing up the copybook and playing low block 442 um so yeah i think that this is this is going to be the area that that is 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 um is, is interesting to watch with with postacoglu and look maybe we get two years down the line and we decide that he hasn't been able to evolve in that mm -hmm. way but what what will have been achieved in that time is that the club will be on a much more stable footing 100%. regardless yeah. right he'll have yeah. got you to a position where the squad will be in a better uh, uh, situation. You'll be able to bring in a manager who will be able to build on that, and Correct. and and that's what that's what good clubs should should be doing. I think I, I think I look at Spurs as an elite side, and I'm I'm very envious of what they achieve. I know that like you have the purple and gold brigade or whatever, and everything's terrible, mm. um, allegedly. But like the fact that we're now entering this FFP reality where mm. teams have to be careful with the money, you know. Daniel Levy is being is is being um, backed up almost in that sense. Yeah. Where you find your uh, edges then comes in being able to be smart in the transfer market, and you've brought in, you know, you brought in um, a director of football. You've brought in uh, a much more analytical recruitment department. Um, yeah. You have to be careful with money. You've been careful with money. You brought in a manager who has a system that you can recruit to. These are all like smart moves. And I think we'll, we'll set Spurs up to, to be able to compete at the highest level, but without just falling into that trap of just being like, well, all we need to do is spend a hundred million pounds every window or 200 million pounds every summer to, to get there. So again, like I think with Poster Cogley, what you get is a manager who allows the rest of the club to do the job that they are trying to do without necessarily being you know the the opposite that you know someone like Jose Mourinho or Antonio Conte where yeah. you know it wasn't just about what was happening on the field off the field that they made he made they made it impossible for for the club to function so i would i, I don't know i i i have very uh, positive feelings when i when i look at what's going on at spurs Agreed. i see i see and have questions about postacoglu but in terms of what football clubs should or are trying to achieve i think that spurs do a very good job in the elite game, in the, the richest league in the world, in the most tactically advanced league in the world right now, um, of of keeping up with with the, the the other elite sides. Okay, well, I'm very much still strapped in for this ride, and I hate <laughs> I hate roller coasters, but uh, I'm in for this one. John, really, really great to speak to you again. Thanks so much for joining us, and we'll talk to you soon.
Cheers, John. Thank Absolutely you. my pleasure. Thank yeah, you. thanks, guys. Uh, oh, I've calmed down now. <laughs> <laughs> he can come on again. <laughs> he can come on again. Look, as I've said just before and on social media... He's literally changed your mind, hasn't he? I, mean, I, 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 I kind of knew all this anyway. <laughs> no, no, I, it's obvious. We've spoken about it ad nauseum to ex-players, to people like John, so to journalists and pundits, and all these people have told us what we're going to get from Ange. I'm just still worried, I am, about the got to score twice to win. I know we, you've said this before and people say, oh, Klopp had this in his first season, Arteta had this in his first season, you know, well, if we're going to go and challenge like they've done, then fine, are we? That's always your point. But I do think you have to, I think it's more something that you're going to look back on. You, you can only make this, to, you, this judgment, I think, in two or three seasons down the line. Is this season going to be the stepping stone to changing a little bit, adapting, bringing in more players? Well, you know, as, as John said, uh, suddenly, suddenly these fullbacks that we've got uh, the two that, that the, the starters, Poro and Udogi, fantastic. But at the beginning of the season, we didn't know where we'd be at. So maybe over the summer, as he said, a few more windows. Well, we're, we're a year, just very quickly, we're a year from the Conte rant mm. where he said... We're five minutes from the Blaine rant. <laughs> he said, the players, where are the players? In my, ex in my experience, I can tell you that if you want to be competitive, if you want to fight, you have to improve this aspect. And this aspect, I can tell you, in this moment, is really, really low. And I only see 11 players that play for themselves. And just totally changed that. And he had his own, it wasn't a rant, his own uh, monologue this week when he said, talked about, I don't care if we finish fourth or fifth. It's not about finishing fourth or fifth. It's about if we get, are we ready, are we moving on this journey where I want to take us. For fans, we do want to finish fourth or fifth. And I know fourth isn't a trophy, but it is an achievement because it's an improvement on last season. And we all want to play. We do want to finish fourth or fifth this season. Say again. We do want to finish fourth or fifth this season. Yeah, it's not where we want to finish. But I think Angie's point is he'd happily finish seventh as long as we were playing the way he wants to play. And no, I, think, I don't I th think that is the point. I think the I think the point is is that he said he didn't just say I don't care where he said I don't care about the top four and all that. It's all about how we play. Mm. And I think the subtext of that is if we play well, the positions and the results will take we'll care of them. themselves. I think the most salient point that John made, and and it is salient, and it is absolutely the nail on the head stuff. And it goes back to what we were discussing in the summer when we were talking about the type of profile of manager we want. And I remember saying at that time, I don't think our next manager is necessarily the manager that is going to take us back to the glory days. It's the manager that is going to implant and imprint the foundation of the DNA of the club going forwards. I think we've understood as a club what we want to be, the football that we want to play. So we talk about where Ange is going to go and is he going to evolve? And John made the very good point. What's the worst that's going to happen in two years' time if Ange hasn't evolved? Well, you're going to be in a much better place than you are at the moment. You're going to be playing better football. You're going to be much better set up for the next guy to come in. And I think that's the whole point of Ange, right? Is I'm not downplaying his chance of success here and I'm not saying that he shouldn't achieve success. What I am saying is exactly what I said in the summer, that his job ultimately is to stabilise the club and put in a DNA and a foundation from which this club will go forwards. And that will be a DNA that he either achieves success with or somebody else down the line will achieve success with. But you can already see it happening with the signings of players like Lucas Bergfall and so on and so forth. This is the way that we're going to go and this is what we're building towards. I think Andrew's the right guy to do that, exactly the right guy to do that. I hope that he achieves success with it. But if he doesn't, nothing bad is going to happen. We're still going to be one of the top four teams yeah, I, in I, a great position to kick on. I get it. I do get it. I think, listen, we spoke to James Holland. I also want to just tee up quickly next week. We've got Thomas Broich. And when we interviewed James Holland, a few of our, of our Australian listeners said, get hold of Thomas Broich. He will tell you more about Ange. So we're going to talk to Thomas next week. And he'll probably say the same things and over and over again, I get it. But I just feel he needs to adapt adapt a little bit more. Look, we're going to have a shorter pod today because we didn't want to talk about Fulham. Um, <laughs> and we've got nothing to preview. Um, but it's good to just speak to John because, you know, he, his stuff is brilliant on TIFO. He says he's got uh, a bit on Ange coming out um, tomorrow with the with the Athletic and the TIFO podcast that they put together. So that was really good. And you know, you're, you're, you're an optimist by heart. Ever. Yeah, I'm just, I, it's great. It's fun. I just, I don't know, I want to adapt a little bit more. <laughs> anyway, happy birthday, Gary. <laughs> <laughs> happy birthday, Gary. Well, Spurs aren't playing, so yeah. it might be all right. <laughs> um, listen, we'll be back next week. And like I say, shorter show today because we didn't want to go deep into the Fulham <laughs> stuff because it was an absolute nonsense. Uh, <laughs> it, was just, it was a bump in the road and we'll be back beating Luton in a couple of weeks' time. Jack, you're not with us next week? I can't really remember what I'm doing. Oh, yeah, I've got, I've got some work stuff. To do. He's got some work to do. He's got to go find his phone. Take yeah. a trip to Marseille. Uh, Gary, happy birthday. We will see Cheers. you next week. Uh, and... 
We will see you all again soon and up the Spurs.